Good day everyone and welcome to our next lesson. In this video, we will be talking about nuclear chemistry, a brief introduction, its basics, and its applications. So let's begin. Before we proceed to the basics of nuclear chemistry, let's first have a little review. In this review, we want to determine the number of protons, neutrons, and electrons in the following elements. So I have here three elements, and that is carbon, uranium, and cobalt. However, you would see that there are numbers at the top and at the bottom of the elements. Let's start with the number at the bottom. The number at the bottom represents the atomic number of the element. So we say that carbon having a number 6 at the bottom indicates that carbon is number 6 in the periodic table and uranium is number 92 in the periodic table. However, if you take a look at cobalt, there is no number at the bottom of cobalt which means that we have to take a look at the periodic table to supply the atomic number of cobalt. So let's take a look at the periodic table. Okay, and then let's find cobalt. Cobalt is over here, and as you can see, the atomic number of cobalt is 27. That means that the number at the bottom of the symbol for cobalt is 27. Okay, so if the atomic number is not given, then it's your task to find that in the periodic table. Going back, how about the number at the top? The number at the top represents the mass number, and the mass number is the sum of the number of protons and neutrons in a specific atom. For carbon-14 here, we say that carbon having an atomic number of 6, meaning it has 6 protons, and having a mass number of 14, meaning it has 6 protons and 8 neutrons. So where did I get the number 8? That is 14 minus 6 is equal to 8. Okay, always remember that the mass number represented by the upper number here is always the combination or is always the sum of the number of protons and neutrons of an atom. Now, how about the number of electrons? The number of electrons in this case would also be equal to the number of protons because there is no charge on the atom. So if carbon here is positively charged, meaning that you have one more proton than you have electrons, and when your atom is negatively charged, that means that you have more electrons than protons. For carbon-14, as we have discussed, has 6 protons, it also has 6 electrons, and it has 8 neutrons. Next item is uranium. In this case, that is uranium-238 with an atomic number of 92. The lower number or the atomic number is always the number of protons and it's equal to the number of electrons if the atom does not contain a charge. So seeing that it does not contain a charge, we say that uranium-238 has 92 protons, also 92 electrons, and for the number of neutrons, we have to subtract 92 from 238. The answer is 146 neutrons. Always remember this as our process of obtaining the number of protons, neutrons, and electrons of a given atom. Okay? And then the last one, we have cobalt-60, which we have earlier determined to have an atomic number of 27, meaning it has 27 protons, 27 electrons, and for the number of neutrons, we subtract 27 from 60, we have 33 neutrons. Okay? So do not forget this method because this will be important for us later in all of our calculations from balancing nuclear equations to determining the stability of isotopes. Let's proceed. For the first part of our introduction, let's first define some terms related to nuclear chemistry. First, let's define isotopes. Isotopes are particles of the same elements having a different number of neutrons. That is why it's important for us to open with a review session from which we determine the number of neutrons for a particular atom. And the number of neutrons are what sets isotopes apart. Isotopes are basically the same elements, but they differ in the number of neutrons. A classic example of isotopes are carbon-12 and carbon-14. To prove that carbon-12 and carbon-14 are isotopes, let's count the number of protons, electrons, and neutrons for each atom. So as you can see, they are the same elements, but they can be isotopes if they have a different number of neutrons. So let's start with the number of protons. Since they are the same atom, they should have the same number of protons. Because if you change the number of protons, then you will end up with a different element. So for carbon-12, you have 6 protons. For carbon-14, you still have 6 protons. And seeing that both atoms do not have charges, neither positive nor negative, 
the number of electrons should be the same as the number of protons, and that is 6 as well. Now, again, for the number of neutrons, we simply subtract the atomic number from the mass number. So for carbon-12, our number of neutrons is 6 because 12 minus 6 is equal to 6. While for carbon-14, as we have determined earlier, 14 minus 6 is 8. Now, this difference in the number of neutrons for these two same elements is what makes them isotopes. Okay? Now, in nuclear chemistry, you would soon realize that different isotopes of the same elements could have different applications in the field because some of these isotopes are stable and some of these isotopes are radioactive. And that is what we are going to discuss later. Okay? Going back. Let's now define nucleons. So nucleons are defined as particles in the nucleus, i.e. that is protons and neutrons. So protons and neutrons are the only subatomic particles that reside in the nucleus. If you go back to our standard model of the atom, neutrons and protons are clumped together in the nucleus and electrons are revolving around our nucleus. Okay? The definition of nucleons is important because in nuclear chemistry, it is the nucleons that are being exchanged in nuclear reactions. If you contrast nuclear reactions and chemical reactions, one of their main differences is that in chemical reactions, it is the electrons which are being transferred from one compound or from one atom to the other to form new compounds. However, in nuclear reactions, it is the nucleons which are being transferred from one species to the other. Okay, And that's their biggest distinction. So again, for chemical reactions, we are studying the transfer of electrons. And for nuclear chemistry, we are studying the transfer of nucleons. Okay? Next is an alpha particle. An alpha particle is a helium nucleus possessing a positive charge. And we represent alpha particles in nuclear reactions as helium with an atomic number of 2 and with a mass number of 4. Or, alternatively, we can also represent alpha particle as the Greek letter alpha. Next particle, we have the beta particle. So the beta particle is basically an electron possessing a negative charge. An electron does not contain any protons nor neutrons. That's why its mass number is zero. And technically, it does not have an atomic number. That's why we represent the bottom number in a beta particle as negative one, representing the electron itself. Okay, so that's negative one at the bottom and it's zero at the top. Later on, you will realize what are the significance of this bottom and above numbers in the nuclear reaction. Okay, next particle, we have the positron. The positron is the opposite of the beta particle. It's basically a positive electron. It's still zero at the top because it does not contain any proton nor neutrons, but the number at the bottom is positive one, representing the positive nature of the positron. Okay, and then finally, we have the gamma ray which is not a particle, but sometimes it is represented in nuclear reactions as something that is being emitted during nuclear reactions. We represent gamma rays as the Greek letter gamma. And the numbers at the top and at the bottom are both zero because, again, it's not a particle. Okay, It's an electromagnetic wave. Here we have a summary of our elementary particles in nuclear reactions. That's the alpha particle, beta particle, positron, and gamma ray. Let us include another one, and that is the representation of the neutron. So neutrons are represented simply by the letter N. Its mass number is 1 because the total number of protons and neutrons in a neutron is 1. It's the neutron itself, but the bottom number is 0. And the last one, to round up our symbols, is the proton. We represent the proton as either with the letter P, with both numbers at the top and at the bottom as 1, or using the hydrogen nucleus, that is hydrogen 1. I want you to remember the representations of the six elementary particles in nuclear reactions. We will be using a lot of this later. Okay, let's move on. Let's discuss the types of nuclear reactions. The types of nuclear reactions basically follow what type of particle are they absorbing or what type of particle are they emitting during the course of the reaction. First on the list is alpha decay or alpha emission. Alpha decay is a nuclear reaction wherein an alpha particle is released. 
when we say an alpha particle is released, we expect that the alpha particle is part of the products. Next type, we have the beta decay or beta emission, a nuclear reaction wherein a beta particle is released. So it's the same as the alpha decay, but in this case, the beta particle is now part of your product instead of the alpha particle. Okay. Next, we have positron decay or positron emission, a nuclear reaction wherein a positron is released. So basically, a positron is now part of your products because it's being released. And the last one, we have the electron capture, wherein a beta particle is absorbed by the reactant. In this case, the beta particle is now part of your reactants. Let's illustrate these types of nuclear reactions through examples. Take a look at example number one. So we are to write the balanced nuclear equation that is described by the following phrases. First, uranium-234 decays via alpha emission. So how do we write a balanced nuclear reaction coming from this statement? So first, you have to identify your isotope. Your isotope in this case is uranium-234, but if you take a look at this representation, it lacks the number below or it lacks the atomic number. So we have to look for the atomic number of uranium. From our periodic table, uranium is right here, atomic number of 92. So how do we write the balanced nuclear reaction for the alpha decay of uranium-234? We first write uranium-234, atomic number of 92. And it says in the problem that uranium-234 undergoes alpha decay, meaning that we know that the alpha particle is one of our products. So let's write the alpha particle, that is helium-4, atomic number of 2, plus blank. The blank in this case should be determined by you. The blank in this case needs to be determined. And in this case, it's a different element. Because when a certain element undergoes alpha decay, it always results to a different element because the number of protons and neutrons will be changed by the alpha decay. Okay, so how do we determine what is the other product of this alpha decay? It's as simple as counting the top and the bottom numbers and balancing them out. What I mean by that is if you take a look at the reactants and in the products, the sum of the numbers at the top and the sum of the numbers at the bottom should be balanced. So if you contrast this with a chemical reaction, in a chemical reaction, we are balancing the number of atoms of each element, okay? While in nuclear reactions, we are balancing the atomic number and the mass number. So let me solve this problem for you. Let's first take a look at the bottom numbers or the atomic numbers. In the reactant side, the sum of the atomic numbers is 92 because we only have one reactant. While on the product side, currently the sum is 2 because that is coming from the alpha particle or the helium with an atomic number of 2. So what number do we need to add to 2 in order for the sum to become 92? And the answer is 90. That is the bottom number of our unknown elements in the reactant side, such that 90 plus 2 is equal to 92. Okay? And then we do the same for the top number or for the mass number. On the reactant side, our mass number is 234. On the product side, currently we only have 4. So what do we add to 4 to make it 234? That is 230. So now that we have the top number or the mass number and the atomic number at the bottom, we can now determine what type of element is this unknown. So how do you determine what type of element is this? You simply take a look at the atomic number. The atomic number of our unknown is 90 coming from our calculations, you go to the periodic table, and then you look for element number 90. So where is element number 90? It's right here, and that element is thorium. So through our solved atomic number of the unknown products, we now know that one of our products is thorium. That's thorium-230. And this is now a balanced nuclear reaction. And this represents the alpha decay of uranium-234. Okay, let's have the next one. Uranium-234 decays via beta emission. So it's the same reactant, but this time our decay would be through beta emission. So if the decay is through beta emission or through beta particle emission, we write the nuclear equation as uranium-234, atomic number 92, yields 
the beta particle, that's beta negative 1, 0, plus an unknown product. We basically do the same steps here. We balance the atomic numbers and the mass numbers for us to come up with the product element. This time, let's start with the mass number because it's very easy. You are simply balancing 234 and 0 on the other side. So in order for that to balance, we need to still have 234 as the mass number of our unknown element. At the bottom number, take note that the bottom number of the beta particle is negative 1. So what can we add to negative 1 such that the sum would be 92? And that is 93. Such that 93 plus negative 1 is equal to 92. Now let's determine the identity of our missing product. And that is element number 93 on the periodic table. And we search element number 93 is Neptunium. So our missing product is now Neptunium 234. And this is an example of a beta decay. Okay, next one. We have Polonium 207 decays via positron emission. So let's take a look at the atomic number of Polonium. Okay, Polonium is over here. And the atomic number is 84. So we write that as polonium-207 atomic mass of 84. Now, if the process is through positron emission, we expect that one of our products is the positron. And the positron is the opposite of the electron. And plus, of course, an unknown other product. Okay? And then we do the same. We balance the bottom numbers. That is 84 on the reactant side. And in the product side, in order for the sum of the atomic numbers to become 84, our unknown product should have an atomic number of 83. And for the mass numbers, it's very easy to balance. We have 207 at the top. Now let's look for element number 83. Element number 83 is bismuth. So we say that our other product is bismuth. 207. And this is through positron emission or positron decay. Okay, and lastly, we have beryllium 7 decays via electron capture. So going to our periodic table, we see that beryllium has an atomic number of 4, so therefore its bottom number should be 4. So we write that as beryllium 7 plus an electron because this is electron capture yields an unknown product. Okay, the placement of the elementary particle is on the reactant side, but the concept of balancing is still the same. So we balance the top and the bottom numbers. So for the bottom numbers, the new atomic mass of our product will be 3, because 4 minus 1 is equal to 3, and our mass number will still be 7. Okay. And what is element number 3? From our periodic table, element number 3 is lithium. So our unknown product is lithium 7. Okay, so these are the skills needed for you to determine an unknown product in a nuclear reaction. And before we can determine the unknown product, we first need to balance both the mass number and the atomic number. Okay, let's move on. This is a practice exercise for you. You first do it yourself, and then after doing it, if you want to verify if your answers are correct, you can message me in Microsoft Teams. In this case, the key to mastery is practice and more practice. Now, let's talk about nuclear stability. Nuclear stability is mostly determined by the N over Z ratio, where N is the number of neutrons, while Z is the atomic number. So basically, we are saying that our numerator is the number of neutrons and our denominator is the number of protons. Okay, so that's neutrons over protons. When it comes to our discussion in nuclear stability, the only question that will be asked is, is it stable or is it not stable? Okay, so we have devised some guidelines that will help us determine if an isotope is stable or not. Okay, the first guideline is, all elements beyond bismuth are unstable and mostly undergo alpha decay. When we say all elements beyond bismuth, that means all elements with an atomic number greater than 83. So that is polonium, astatine, radon, francium, radium, and etc. etc. If its atomic number is greater than 83, then it probably is unstable and it mostly undergoes alpha decay. 
And maybe you're asking, why are elements beyond bismuth unstable and why do they undergo alpha decay most of the time? Now, the answer to that is the heavy elements often undergo alpha decay because they want to lose protons. Because if they lose protons, then their atomic number decreases up to a point that they reach a stable state. So let's say, for example, let's take the case of astatine. Astatine has an atomic number of 85, which in our guidelines is unstable, meaning for astatine to be stable, it has to emit one alpha particle. And during that process, the atomic number of astatine reduces from 85 to 83. Once it reaches 83, then it's already stable. So basically, we are saying that alpha decay is a method that can be used by heavier elements so that they can transform and become lighter and more stable elements. Okay, let's proceed. Let's now talk about the stability of elements with atomic number of 20 and below. So that is calcium and below. So for those elements, we can say that they are stable if the number of neutrons and the number of protons are equal. That is, if we take the ratio of the number of neutrons divided by the number of protons, we get a value of 1. Okay? Again, n over z ratio is equal to 1. For light elements, that signals stability. If the n over z ratio for light elements is no longer equal to 1, if it's either greater than 1 or less than 1, meaning either neutrons are greater than protons or protons are greater than neutrons, that may mean that the particular isotope is unstable. Okay? So if there are more neutrons than protons, meaning that the n over z ratio is greater than 1, not only is the isotope unstable, but it's likely to undergo beta decay. But if there are more protons than neutrons, meaning that the n over z ratio is less than 1, the isotope is unstable and it is likely to undergo positron decay. Okay, so if your n over z ratio for light elements is not equal to 1, then your two choices are that isotope could undergo beta decay if n over z is greater than 1 or positron decay if n over z is less than 1. We will be applying this with examples later. But you might be asking, what are our guidelines for the elements that are heavier than calcium? but are lighter than bismuth. So for that band of elements, which are in the intermediate range between light and heavy, we don't have a general rule that will be true for all isotopes. What we do have are some very loose guidelines. One of those is that if the number of neutrons and the number of protons are both even numbers, then we can say that that isotope is probably stable. Okay, We cannot say that with 100% certainty because there are exemptions to this rule. Some isotopes in the intermediate range are stable even though they have an even number of protons but an odd number of neutrons, or they have an odd number of protons but an even number of neutrons. But we say that for our rule of thumb for intermediate elements, if the number of protons and the number of neutrons are both even numbers, we can say that they are probably stable. The only way that we can be 100% sure if an isotope is stable or not is to perform rigorous research. Okay, so let us apply our learnings on the guidelines of nuclear stability in the following examples. Determine if the following isotopes are stable or unstable. If unstable, propose a decay equation to make it stable. Let's begin with number one, that is potassium-42, atomic number of 19. So we will be using our second guideline here because potassium is a light element. And I will repeat, for light elements to become stable, their number of protons should be the same with the number of neutrons. Okay, we write potassium-42 as such. And let's first determine its number of protons and neutrons. So just by looking at this notation, we can already say that the number of protons, or what we represent as letter Z in our calculations, is 19 because the atomic number of potassium is 19. Now, the number of neutrons, or what we represent as capital letter N in our notation, is simply the difference between the mass number and the atomic number. So 42 minus 19 is 23. Now we can determine the N over Z ratio. So that is N over Z, 23 over 19. And we no longer have to solve this to say that our N over Z ratio is greater than 1. And what do we say when our N over Z ratio is greater than 1 is that potassium-42 is unstable and it would likely undergo beta emission. So for beta emission or beta decay, what happens is potassium-42 will release beta particles. 
and then a new element will be one of the by products. Okay, so what will be our unknown products? So we know that the atomic number of the unknown product would have to be 20 to balance the bottom numbers, and to balance the upper numbers, it has to be 42. Now, element number 20, as we have discussed earlier, is calcium. So we say that potassium-42 is an unstable isotope, and for it to become stable, it has to undergo beta emission or beta decay. Now the question is, is our product stable as well? Is calcium-42 stable? Now, upon first look, calcium is still one of the light elements, but if we take a look at the number of protons and the number of neutrons, calcium has 20 protons and 22 neutrons. Both are even numbers. And one of our guidelines is that if the number of protons and the number of neutrons are both even numbers, then the isotope is probably stable. Okay, so right now we can say that this is our end product and that calcium-42 is stable. That is how we use our guidelines for the stability of isotopes, okay? You can mix several guidelines together in order to determine up to a particular level of certainty that this isotope is stable. Next example. Number two, we have uranium-234, atomic number of 92. Now, uranium is considered as a heavy element because its atomic number 92 is greater than that of bismuth, which is 83. So therefore, we can already say that this is probably unstable and it will undergo alpha decay until it becomes stable. So if uranium-234 undergoes alpha decay, what will be its products? We have tackled this example at the beginning of our lecture. So balancing, we have an atomic number of 90 and a mass number of 230, and element 90 is thorium. We say that uranium-234 decays via alpha emission into thorium-230. Now, this is just the first step of the decay because the product thorium-230 is still a heavy element. Therefore, it would still undergo alpha decay until it reaches a point wherein its atomic number is 83. And for that to happen, it would take four more alpha decays for thorium to be transformed to lead. Remember that for every step of an alpha decay, the atomic number decreases by two, such that we can predict what elements will come out of the alpha decay. So let's take a look at our periodic table. Again, we started with uranium with an atomic number of 92. And upon the first step of the alpha decay, it has been transformed to thorium with an atomic number of 90. You can then imagine that for the next step, 90 minus 2 is 88. Element number 88 is radium, which is still a heavy element. It has an atomic number of 88. Minus 2, we have 86. That is radon, still heavy. Minus 2, we have polonium, atomic number of 84. And finally, the alpha decay of polonium will lead us to lead with an atomic number of 82, which is now stable. We call that the decay series of an unstable element. Now, what we are talking about is if the isotope will undergo decay or not. We are not yet talking about how fast or how slow would the decay be. Let's say, for example, for thorium, one of the isotopes of thorium has a half-life of around 14 billion years. When we say half-life, that means that for one gram of the unstable isotope of thorium to be reduced to one half of that, meaning 0.5 grams, it would take you 14 billion years. Okay? So that means that it's still decaying, but it's very, very, very slow. Again, just a recap, whenever we are talking about alpha decay, you simply have to subtract 2 from the atomic mass, and then you can start imagining from the periodic table what will be the final form of your element. Okay, let's go back. The final example is palladium-104. Now, take a look at the atomic number of palladium, that is 46. That is greater than 20, meaning it's not a light element, but it's less than 83, meaning it's not a heavy element. So for the transition region between the light and the heavy elements, one of the most reliable tools we can use to determine the stability of the isotope is to determine if the number of protons and neutrons for the isotope are even numbers. So for palladium-104, we can definitely say that the number of protons is an even number because palladium has 46 protons. Now for the number of neutrons, we simply subtract 46 from 104. We get 58, which is again an even number. That means that both the number of protons and neutrons for palladium-104 is even. That means that it's highly probable that palladium-104 is a stable isotope. Okay? 
So that's how we use those guidelines. Let's proceed. Now let's talk about nuclear transmutation. Nuclear transmutation is simply defined as the conversion from one element or isotope to another. Now we have already performed transmutation in our previous examples, particularly in the cases of alpha decay. Because remember, whenever alpha decay happens, one element is transformed to another element because we are changing its atomic number. Nuclear transmutation can be done either naturally or artificially. For natural transmutation, a very good example is the natural formation of carbon-14. So for those of you who are wondering what's special about carbon-14, carbon-14 is being used for a process that we call radiocarbon dating. If you have heard of the technique being used to determine the age of fossils, then carbon-14 is the one being used there. Carbon-14 is formed when high-energy neutrons collide with nitrogen-14 that is common in our atmosphere. So nitrogen-14 plus one neutron yields carbon-14 plus a proton. So it is this carbon-14 that is unstable that gets assimilated to our bodies as we take in forms of carbon, such as our food. And what happens is over time, we accumulate a certain amount of carbon-14 in our bodies. And then when we die, we stop eating food, we stop assimilating carbon-14, and the carbon-14 in our body is unstable and it starts to decay. Okay? The rate of decay of carbon-14 in living bodies is the basis of radiocarbon dating. So by this method, we can determine how long has it been from the death of this organism. Okay? And that's an example of a natural transmutation. How about artificial transmutation? So artificial transmutation is done by bombarding atoms with light particles, such as alpha particles, neutrons, and other light nuclei. And this process led to the discovery of the man-made elements, which are what we call the trans-uranium elements or the elements beyond uranium. One such example is given in the second equation. You have plutonium-244 being bombarded with calcium-48 nuclei, resulting with the formation of flerovium-289. Flerovium, if we take a look at our periodic table, is right here, atomic number of 114. So this is what we call a super heavy element. And the neighbors of flerovium, such as nihonium, moscovium, livermorium, etc., are also discovered via artificial transmutation. For our other example here, we have curium-248 atoms being bombarded with calcium-48, resulting to livermorium-293. Atomic number of livermorium is 116. Okay? So that is how artificial transmutation works. Also notice that neutrons are being released in the process. So neutrons are sometimes the byproducts of artificial transmutation. Let's try to answer these examples. Determine the missing isotope from the following transmutations. So we are just calling these transmutations, but basically what these are are still nuclear equations. And the way on how we determine the missing species is the same as what we have done at the beginning of this lesson. Okay? We just balance the bottom and the top numbers separately, and then we determine what is the identity of that element. Let's start with number one. We have oxygen 16 plus a proton yields an alpha particle plus blank. So let's first balance the atomic numbers. On the reactant side, our total is 9. On the product side, we only have 2. So to make that 9, we should add 7. Next is the mass numbers. On the reactant side, we have a total of 17. On the product side, we only have 4. So what do we add to 4 to make it equal to 17? That is 13. And then let's see what is element number 7. Element 7 is nitrogen. So therefore, we say that our missing product is nitrogen 13. Okay, next, number 2, we have nickel 64 plus bismuth 209 yields a neutron plus blank. So balancing the atomic numbers. For the reactant side, we have 111, that's 83 plus 28. On the product side, neutron has zero atomic number, so therefore, our missing product should have an atomic number of 111. And then for the mass number, that is 64 plus 209, that is 273. On the product side, we only have one, therefore, our upper number for the unknown should be 272. Such that 272 plus 1 is equal to 273. And then let's see what element 111 is. Element 111 is rowentgenium. Therefore, our product is rowentgenium 272. Okay, how about the last one? 
For the last one, we are missing a reactant. So let's start at the product side. For the atomic numbers, the total is 15. So therefore, on your reactant side, you need to add 2 to the atomic number to make it balanced. For the upper number or the mass number, on the product side, we have 31. On the reactant side, we have 27. The difference of that is 4. 4 as the mass number and 2 as the atomic number. This is familiar. This is an alpha particle or a positively charged helium atom. Okay? That is how we balance nuclear equations. Let's proceed. Let's solve this worded problem. In 1998, researchers in Dubna, Russia, synthesized element 112, which is named copernicium, by bombardment of uranium-238 nuclei with calcium-48 nuclei. The copernicium-283 isotope was produced along with neutrons. Write a balanced nuclear equation to represent this synthesis. For this problem, we shall start by determining what are your reactants and what are your products in the nuclear equation. Our reactants were the nuclei that have been bombarded, that is uranium-238 and calcium-48. And your product in this case will be the synthesized element, which is copernicium-283, plus neutrons, as stated in the problem. So this is how we represent our transmutation equation or our nuclear reaction. You have uranium-238 plus calcium-48 yields copernicium-283 plus neutrons. However, the problem stated that neutrons were released, that is plural, meaning that multiple neutrons could be involved in this process. Now, in order for us to determine how many neutrons were released, again, we need to balance the mass numbers. On the reactant side, we have 238 plus 48, we get 286. And on the product side, that is 283 plus 1 neutron, that is only 284. However, we need to reach 286. So we cannot add any more particles no, to this equation because this equation is what was described by the problem. Instead of us adding more particles, we can do here what we are usually doing with chemical equations, and that is we can also multiply coefficients to some of the species. In this case, we can multiply the neutron term with a coefficient such that it satisfies our balance. So looking at our example on the product side, our total mass number should be 286, but so far we are at 284, and we can fix that by multiplying 3 to the number of neutrons. What that does is now, the mass number of the neutrons is now 3 total because you have 3 neutrons plus 283 that is equal to 286 and that is now balanced okay the only thing left for us now is to determine if the atomic numbers are balanced as well so the atomic number of uranium is 92 atomic number of calcium is 20 92 plus 20 is equal to 112 so is the atomic number of copernicium equal to 112 we take a look at the periodic table. Element 112 is copernicium. That means we have already balanced the equation. Therefore, we say that this is now our balanced transmutation equation. Okay? So that is how you convert worded problems to nuclear equations. Let's proceed. Now, let's talk about nuclear fission and fusion. I think you are already familiar with the concept of nuclear fission and fusion no? because these are what's being normally mentioned when we are talking about applications of nuclear chemistry. So let's start with nuclear fission. Nuclear fission is simply the splitting of a heavy nuclei into two or more lighter particles. Now nuclear fission has something to do with the stability of the nuclei. Very heavy nuclei can split apart or undergo fission to form lighter nuclei with greater binding energy, thereby releasing energy. One of the most familiar fissionable isotopes we have is uranium-235 because we use it in the generation of electricity in nuclear power plants. So the nuclear fission of uranium-232 starts when the uranium-235 nuclei is bombarded by a neutron and the bombardment would cause it to split into two nuclei. The first would be krypton-92, the second would be barium-141, along with three neutrons. Now, the three neutrons that we have produced from this fission would go on and split more uranium-235 atoms, thus creating the so-called chain reaction. And if we cannot control this chain reaction, this reaction would happen so fast that it would result to an explosion instead of the controlled release of energy. 
That's why in nuclear reactors, we have so-called control rods, which slow down the production of the neutrons and thus slowing down the fission reaction. Okay? Again, as I've said, nuclear fission requires a fissionable material, control rods, and an initiator. The fissionable material acts as our fuel. The control rods control the rate of the nuclear reaction, and the initiator provides neutrons that jumpstart the nuclear reaction. These reactions are what happens during the fission of uranium-235. So uranium-235 joins with one neutron, but the product uranium-236 is unstable. So uranium-236 splits into barium-141 and krypton-92 along with three neutrons. Okay? This is the anatomy of a nuclear power plant. At the core of the nuclear power plant is your reactor. In the reactor, we have two kinds of rods. You have your fuel rod containing the uranium-235, and we also have the control rods. Again, the function of the control rods is to control the rate of the reaction. So if you insert the control rod, that would make the reaction go slower. But if you withdraw the rod, then the reaction would start to go faster. So it is the withdrawal and the insertion of the control rods which dictate the rate of the nuclear reaction. The entire reactor core is surrounded by water under high pressure and the heat being generated by the nuclear reaction is transferred to the high pressure water from which the heat is transferred to a secondary coolant and the steam being produced from the secondary coolant goes into a turbine which ultimately generates the electricity. And then the waste steam exiting the turbine enters the cooling tower in which its temperature is further brought down. So whenever you see a cooling tower from a nuclear power plant, always remember that its emissions is not like the ones from the coal-fired power plant, which is smoke from combustion. These emissions from the cooling tower are just a result of the cooling of the heat exchange fluid in the nuclear power plant. So nuclear power plants actually do not generate CO2 or other types of pollutants. The output of the process are electricity and water vapor. Next, let's briefly talk about nuclear fusion. The most common example of nuclear fusion is what is happening in our sun itself and to the other stars. So nuclear fusion is the combination of light nuclei to form a heavier one, releasing a large amount of energy. So nuclear fusion reactions are what is powering our sun. And ultimately, considering that the sun is the source of most of our energy from Earth, it's safe to say that we owe our existence to the nuclear fusion in the sun. So what happens inside the sun is you have four protons combining to form an alpha particle and two beta particles. And it is this fusion that generates a large amount of energy. As a comparison, nuclear fission from nuclear power plants already generate a lot of energy, but that amount of energy is even dwarfed by nuclear fusion. Okay? So nuclear fusion is being researched right now because it is hypothesized that nuclear fusion can be a viable source of clean and virtually limitless amount of energy in the future. It does not produce any pollutant unlike coal-fired power plants, but the number one problem is it's very difficult to contain the plasma that sustains the nuclear fusion reaction. And besides, nuclear fusion requires a large amount of energy to start the fusion reaction. Okay? Other notable applications of nuclear chemistry include medical and research applications for determining the age of fossils. We also have here positron emission tomography scan or what we call the PET scan. This allows us to take a look at our internal mechanisms without dissecting us alive. It's a type of non-invasive imagery in medicine. And one of the most popular use of nuclear chemistry in medicine is the use of radiotherapy. Radiotherapy is a process wherein we exploit the byproducts of nuclear reactions, which is ionizing radiation. We are focusing it into cancer cells in order to kill them. Besides this, there are lots and lots of other applications of nuclear chemistry to our everyday lives, and I will be leaving that up to you for further reading. That's it for this lesson. I hope you have learned something. Keep practicing balancing your nuclear equations, and as always, keep safe.